Hey, this is Dr. Emily Sherning with AR, and I'd like to say hello to all of our friends in Northern New England. This state level forecast builds on what I shared in my 2050 forecast for the Northeastern region. In response to that video, I've had a lot of requests for a deeper dive into what we're looking at for Maine and Vermont, and I figured let's throw New Hampshire into the mix. For this video, I'm gonna try and use my new approach where we look at some tools together. The forecast for this part of the country is not entirely pleasant. I'd be more concerned about the outlook if it weren't for the fact that so many of you folks are both tough as nails and way ahead of the curve on getting ready for the changes that are coming. With that in mind, here's what we're gonna talk about. Changes to the land, including the growing season, to trees, including sugar maples, and to animals. Then we'll talk about changes to the sea. I'm gonna look at some sea level rise projections off your coast and share some information about the outlook for crucial fisheries. So let's start with the land. The biggest, most serious change you're looking at is changes to the growing season. You're gonna be looking at earlier spring thaws and later autumn frosts. By 2050, for most of Northern New England, you're gonna be looking at about two weeks increase in your growing season. The prediction is that the changes will start with earlier spring, and then we'll start to see the growing season extend in the fall as well. Now, I wanna share some important information about precipitation. In these three states, you're looking at some reduction in snow by 2050 probably about a quarter fewer days with snow cover in New Hampshire and Vermont, a little less than that in Maine, a little more stability in the snow cover in Maine. Your total precipitation is likely to increase over the course of the year by 15 to 20 percent. That's a lot. Overall, we're looking at a warmer, wetter environment with a lot of that warmth coming in the winter, milder winters. It's worth noting that more hail is forecast for this region and larger hail. That's worth taking into consideration when you think about when to take down hoop houses for the year and what kinds of building materials you want to use for your home and property. All these changes, you can imagine that's going to put stress on some important species for the region. One way to look at the health of a habitat is to think about some of the keystone species, those iconic species. We're going to do that by taking a little look at moose and its sugar maples. Now, talk about moose, I got to do something I hate, which is talk about ticks. As it gets warmer, the tick habitat is spreading north, which means more of a risk of tick-borne diseases for us. I hate ticks. I feel itchy talking about them. And Lyme disease is no joke. I mean, it can damage your brain permanently. Another thing that hates ticks are moose. Moose are already being impacted by these increasing tick populations in Vermont and New Hampshire. The game department thinks there's going to need to be a reduction in the number of moose that Vermont and New Hampshire can support, both to control the total level of ticks in the environment and because all of these changes are just too stressful for the moose population. There are still gonna be moose in those states, but you should expect a pretty dramatic reduction in them. And you can think about how that's gonna change the landscape and habitats downstream when there aren't moose feeding in the forests. In Maine, there's no change to the moose population that seems likely or necessary at this time to the game departments. And you imagine that that reflects an increased stability in the moose habitat overall. Talking about sugar maples now, we're talking about a beautiful tree and we're talking about an economically and culturally important tree. And to talk about what's projected to happen for them, we're gonna use the government's tree atlas. This is a wonderful tool. I'm gonna to recommend that you check it out and we're gonna look at it together here. So just a second. Help if I got it up, right? There we go. So check this out. It's, um, URL is right there. You can put that into your browser. You can type in the names of many trees. You can see a lot of them pop up here. There's hundreds of trees in there. The sugar maple you'll see is a high reliability model, according to the government forecasts. You can have an idea going in when you're looking at a particular species, how confident the government is about their predictions. And then you just click on the name of the tree there. The first thing that pops up is a current forest inventory. So this is where we have sugar maples right now. Unsurprisingly, there's a big concentration of them there in Vermont. Then we're able to look at what they predict is gonna to happen to the trees if we have uh, reduced emissions or if we continue on the same path. And we're gonna click on this together. You can see the colors have changed a lot, but we don't know what that means yet, right? Let's look down here at the legend. These colors indicate the habitat quality for the trees. So if we see more of this yellow, like down here, we see a lot of the yellow for sugar maple, that means the habitat quality is gonna really decrease. The blue habitat quality is okay. Green habitat quality is high. 
And the CL is colonization. That means if the trees are there or not, if they're likely to be able to get up there without help. We can see that there is some of this yellow is moving into our northern New England region and that some of it is starting to move in sort of on the western edge of Vermont here. There will still be sugar maples in the area, but this area is going to decline in its quality of habitat for the sugar maples. And we see some increased habitat quality happening up in Maine. So some of this industry may shift northward and you may find it harder to get young sugar maples to reproduce, to grow in a healthy way. It's important to know, it's important to look at it. And if we were to look at the higher emission scenario, if we continue to produce emissions at the same rate, we can see that that's more extreme than in New Hampshire here, Throughout the coast, we have a real reduction in habitat quality for these trees, a little bit more incursion again on the western edge. You can use that tree atlas to look at a wide variety of trees in the region and see if there are any trees that currently have high habitat quality a little bit south of you that are going to move up. It's a fun tool and it's useful. I hope that you have a good time with it. Check back at the keys if you get confused. I think that you're gonna be able to get a lot out of there. So let's uh, go start talking a little bit about the changes in the sea. We're gonna check out another tool now and look at the sea level rise along the coast. This is a pretty good bright spot actually. It's a much less direct impact from sea level rise than you might've noticed in my Texas forecast if you check that out. Just a second and we'll go over to that NOAA sea level rise tool. All right, I'm screen sharing. There we go. Let's zoom over here to New Hampshire and Maine's coast. So right now we're looking at the mean higher high water mark. So this is where the water tends to max out right now. In Texas, in the Gulf, we're looking at up to three feet of sea level rise by 2050, which is pretty wild. It's not looking that bad over here. We're talking about maybe a foot, two feet under the most extreme scenarios. And I'm gonna show with this slider how that's gonna change the coastline. You can see one foot, two feet. This uh, bright blue are areas that will be under at the MHHW. But if you zoom in, it's really not that extreme. It's really not that bad. And here, let's take a second and zoom in on Portland, for example. You know, we get this unified message on the East Coast that uh, sea level rise is going to impact us all in these terrible ways. And it is very serious for some cities. For New York City, it's extremely serious. But check it out, Portland. Right now, a lot of your housing stock, a lot of your industrial space, this is where the mean higher high water mark is now. This is where it is at two feet. They're gonna get incursion into this area that has clearly been set aside for agriculture because of its potential to flood. A lot of these areas that are gonna become increasingly marshy were already green space. This is some nice urban planning and some nice use of uh, natural resources that are very resistant to sea level rise. You can see, let's zoom in a little bit more here. In the port area, there's some like fuzziness in the model that indicates that the port may experience some impact, but check out the port of Los Angeles, check out the ports around New York City. You'll see that this is very mild. This is a very doable resilience work for Portland. It's pretty cool. Most of what I looked when I did a deep dive around this whole coast was pretty positive, pretty manageable. The only place where I see some serious resilience challenges was here around the town of uh, Old Orchard Beach, the Old Orchard Beach area. You can see that the river system here, and let's go back to the current level. There we go. This is an area where one can tell people know that there can be incursion from the sea because of how it's planned out, all the green space that's been left there. And the fact that many of it is currently inundated when there's unusually high tides. We can see that some of the housing stock, particularly in this area, is 
potentially looking at incursion from sea level rise. This is probably our most vulnerable coastal property in northern New England from the NOAA map is around New Hampshire. So we've looked at some bright spots, some not bright spots, but overall the sea level rise forecast is looking pretty manageable for this region. We're going to stop the share. We're going to talk about something that is more challenging, which is ocean acidification. There's a lot of local ocean acidification in the Gulf of Maine, and it's being driven unusually by freshwater runoff. That water is sometimes making the water in the oyster bed so acidic that the oyster larvae die during these runoff events. The good news is that there's already pH monitoring and correction mechanisms being put in place for these oyster beds. But if you want to have a good outlook for the tidewater species, there's an increasingly serious need to handle runoff from up near the source. And you have to remember there's a forecast for increased precipitation. So there's going to be a tendency to have more and more extreme acidic runoff events. Controlling water in farmland and in towns and cities, working to help it get into the ground so it can filter through instead of going right into the rivers is a big project. But it's a project people can handle as they work together. And as the ocean warms off the coast, as the Gulf of Maine gets warmer and it is forecast to do so, there will be changes occurring in commercially important fish populations. The outlook is not looking great for the Gulf of Maine cod. That catch has been doing poorly and it isn't recovering well. However, black sea bass, the size of that catch has been increasing and it looks like it could remain a very solid fishery up to 2050. Lobsters, if that runoff acidity can be kept under control, they could be doing just fine. That's another stable fishery. And it's worth noting that not only is there a lot of potential to maintain these stable and productive fisheries, but that the coordinated efforts of all of you in this region is exactly what have gotten us this far, what has created the current stable, productive and sustainable fisheries off this coast. So wrapping it all up, there's a lot of work to be done to keep these states strong. Maine, Vermont and New Hampshire, there are real challenges ahead, but the people of these states, you've got what it takes. Think about how you're gonna use that longer growing season, take increased hail into account, think about managing runoff, water runoff and stay tough. This is Dr. Schering with AR, sign up. Please like and subscribe, help get the message out there. There's hope. We can prepare for what's coming. Let's get ready.